but we're going to now uh, start our lesson. The first thing we want to do is read Daniel 1. I know we're all familiar with it, but we're going to focus on some parts of this. And remember, the book of Daniel has a lot of history in it, and I'll be touching on that as we go along, and a lot of prophecy in it. And so we're going to start right now with Daniel 1. So let's open our Bibles. And if I were there with you in the chapel or there with you all listening um, virtually, we would take turns reading, but can't do that now. So let's read along together. And it's 21 verses in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon unto Jerusalem, and besieged it right away. We have history given. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, with part of the vessels of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar, to the house of his God. And he brought the vessels into the treasure house of his God, which happened to be Marduk, going on. And the king spake unto Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel, and of the king's seed, and of the prince's children, in whom was no blemish, but well favored and skillful in all wisdom and cunning and knowledge and understanding science, and such as had ability in them to stand in the king's palace, and whom they might teach the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans. In other words, um, this was a foreign language. They had to learn to speak it. Verse 5, And the king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat and of the wine which he drank. Ellen White tells us he did this because he had care for these people, and he wanted um, the best for them. Nebuchadnezzar, yes, a mighty warrior, and... Um, uh, did a lot of things, but he cared. Isn't that, that's enlightening. Anyway, um, he uh, gave, appointed them a daily provision of his food and drink. So nourishing them three years going on, that at the end thereof they might stand before the king. Now among these were the children of Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, unto whom the prince of the eunuchs, Yes, eunuchs gave names, for he gave unto Daniel the name of Belteshazzar, and to Hananiah of Shadrach, and to Mishael of Meshach, and to Azariah of Abednego. But Daniel purposed in his heart, and that's our verse here, one of the verses to remember. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank, therefore... He requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now God had brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. And the prince of the eunuchs said unto Daniel, I fear my lord the king, who hath appointed your meat and your drink. For why should he see your faces worse liking than the children which are of your sort? Then shall ye make me endanger my head to the king. Period. And Ellen White brings out, you know, that this prince of the eunuchs did not get, uh, work with Daniel on this, did not um, um, give in to his request. So Daniel now goes um, to Melzar, verse 11, then said Daniel to Melzar, whom the prince of the eunuchs had set over Daniel, Ananiah, Mishael and Azariah prove. Now Daniel is adding something else, I guess. Anyway, it's um, he's saying to um, Melzar, Prove thy servants. I beseech thee ten days, and let them give us pulse to eat and water to drink. Then let our countenances be looked upon before thee, and the countenance of the children that eat of the portion of the king's meat, as thou seest, Deal with thy servants. So Melzar consented to this. Verse 14. So he consented to them in this matter and proved them ten days. And at the end of ten days, their countenances appeared fairer and fatter in flesh than all the children which did eat the portions of the king's meat. 
thus Melzar <laughs> took away the portion of their meat and the wine that they should drink and gave them pulse. And we'll talk about pulse as we go on. As for these four children, God gave them knowledge and skill in all learning and wisdom, and Daniel had an understanding in all visions and dreams. Now at the end of the days that the king had said he should bring them in, then the prince of the eunuchs brought them in. And do we know the name of the prince? No, it's just the prince up in verse 10. Now this prince brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar, verse 19. And the king communed with them. And among them all was found none like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore stood they before the king. And in all matters of wisdom and understanding that the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers that were in all his realm. And Daniel continued even unto the first year of Cyrus. Now when we read up in um, verse 19 at the end, Therefore stood they before the king, um, that's a reference, according to the SDA Bible commentary, that they had a position now before the king. They um, were appointed um, a position, and actually that position was to be part of the wise men that instructed the king. And then in verse 21, we have the, uh, an ending part for this section. Uh, Daniel ends it with another history nugget that he continued unto the first year of King Cyrus. Now it seems like there's something I wanted to bring out also before we move on to um, our slide presentation, but I don't recall it and I don't see it. And if you have something to share, yes, we're recording this, so I've trimmed up the space that I see because that's what's being recorded. So if you have something to say, you chat it in in the chat box and I will eventually get to that or you can request that your hand is raised or if you're on the phone, just press star six. But now we're going to open up our slide presentation. It's about diet, a lot about diet here. And, and so that's the the picture we have. But before we get started in studying what is recorded, uh, the, the main part, I should say, of what is recorded in Daniel, particularly the first chapter now, we need to understand the geography of the land. We need to understand the principal players, i.e. Nebuchadnezzar and Daniel for the moment. And we need to also understand um, what, what's going on with Daniel, and that will come later. So right now, I'd like to take you on a mental journey um, of Daniel leaving his country home in, or his home in the country of Palestine, nation of Judah, and being taken over to Babylon. And here you see in this map something we call, it's in red, something we call or we know as the Fertile Crescent. Now the Fertile Crescent isn't a lush uh, tropical environment where anything and everything grows, but there is enough water there, that food can be grown. There are rivers interweaving through this area. If you go straight across, like where it says Lower Egypt on the west, straight across to Elam in that area, you have to cross the Syrian desert. So we can almost be certain that when the captives were taken out of Jerusalem and Judah, they followed this imaginary land called the Fertile Crescent because it uh, it took them uh, near waterways so that there was water they could access. It was a longer journey, yes, it went north and then east instead of straight across through the desert. Now, all of these lands are watered in this fertile crescent area, 
by important rivers like the Nile, the Jordan, Euphrates, and the Tigris, and the region extends from the eastern shore of the Mediterranean, you can see that there on the west side of the map, around the north of the Syrian desert to the Persian Gulf. And right on the Persian Gulf, or very close to it, uh, was the city of Ur. So Abraham of Ur, that's the area. If you can just think of um, close to where the Tigris and Euphrates em empties into the Persian Gulf, Ur is there. However, Babylon is to the west and north of Ur, not a whole lot, but yet, but it's away from the Persian Gulf. These areas in red here are present-day Egypt, Israel, West Bank, Gaza Strip, Le Lebanon, parts of Jordan, Syria, Iraq, parts of Turkey, and parts of Iran. So that right now, today, that area would be known as these nations, Egypt, Israel, etc. However, when Daniel and the rest of the captives left, they left from the Judean area or Jerusalem area. And um, so that's quite a bit north and east of the fertile crescent that occupied Egypt. And I bring that up because we will see now that the route from Jerusalem through this Fertile Crescent area down to Babylon was maybe about 1,700 miles. That's a long way to walk. And, but that's the route they took along the rivers, over, up and over to Babylon. However, and we think... I don't think I could walk 1,700 miles. I, I'm, I might be able to if I had a lifetime <laughs> to do that, of course. But just think for a minute that the Oregon Trail uh, was two, over 2,000 miles long from the Missouri River to Oregon, Oregon, and people covered it in about four to six miles. Of course, they had carts and they rode much of the way. We know carts were used also during the time of Daniel, whether they were utilized for the people. We have no way of knowing. But just think that the travel on the Oregon Trail, over 2,000 miles, was accomplished in maximum about six months, of course, with carts. And so it's not out of the realm of possibility that Daniel and the other uh, people that were taken captive were able to um, walk this route. It took them several months, of course. Um, let's go on now to the next slide. Here's a map. This is from the U.S. government. It's not copyrighted, but it shows the Oregon Trail from... Uh, the Independence area up to Oregon, and of course it crossed mountains, but it, it, people took it, people walked it. So here again we have um, a close-up of Palestine area and the route they probably took. Some of the rivers are there. Now, that's the geography of the land. Desert if they went straight across from Jerusalem to Babylon. But a, a more fertile land with water and, and maybe even crops. And remember, I mean, crops that they could access. Crops were grown. And so that's, that's what they experienced as they traveled. Now, you have to remember, <clears throat> this wasn't the dark ages of intellect back then. Um, Mesopotamia, and particularly Babylon, was a, um, a center of knowledge and information. Remember, Nebuchadnezzar talked to Daniel and his companions. He himself was uh, clued in and understood the science of the day and mathematics and whatever else they studied. Nebuchadnezzar was an intelligent person. His kingdom was composed 
uh, at least of the higher ranking people, of intelligent, educated people. And so they knew the route back and forth. They knew where the rivers were. They knew where the desert was. Nebuchadnezzar, when he heard the death of the death of his father, traversed the desert. That was the quickest way to get home to Babylon and establish his throne. So he knew his way across the desert. People get lost in the desert all the time. But these people, I don't know if they had it mapped out. And I should also tell you that uh, the Sumerians and the Mesopotamian people probably developed the first written language, although it's debatable whether Egypt did that 50 years earlier or 100 years earlier. But they were one of the first to develop, or should I say invent, a written language. Of course, it was cuneiform in figures, no, no letters as we know of today. But So these were intelligent, skilled people, knew how to traverse long distances, had this map either in their minds or written down. And so Nebuchadnezzar also was intelligent. We know him as Nebuchadnezzar II. Nebuchadnezzar II was, and I'll just give you some facts here, and these are the next few slides. Facts are condensed from the introductory article written. I'm trying to remember if that was Siegfried Horn that wrote this introductory article for the prophets in uh, volume four of the old <laughs> SDA Bible commentary. But these are some facts that I've gleaned from it. He was king of Babylon for 43 years from 605 to 562 BC. Now, you're going to get some history here. You're going to see some dates here. You may not have an affinity for that, but try to keep in mind these dates. 605, 562. He is written about in many ancient Babylonian documents. We know he existed. He's in the Bible, of course. But other archaeological finds, secular documents, mention Nebuchadnezzar also. And he played a pivotal role in the fall of the kingdom of Judah. Not just this first time when he took Daniel back, but other invasions occurred. As described in 2 Kings 24, 1 through 25, and I guess that's chapter 25 to 20, oh, ch um, chapter 25, verse 26. So 24 to 25, Nebuchadnezzar invaded Judah three times. The first was in 605, the first year of his reign. The second was in 597, the eighth year of his reign. And the last time was in 588 to 586, when he destroyed Jerusalem and the temple. His involvement with the kingdom of Judah is recorded in five Old Testament books, 2 Kings, 2 Chronicles, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel. His name is found 91 times in the Hebrew or Aramaic text, and it's spelled two different ways. You may be confused when you read this Nebuchadnezzar or Nebuchadrezzar. It's spelled with an N or an R, but it's the same person. His name in cuneiform is this. I thought you might be interested in this because we're going to see some more cuneiform as we go on. Remember, many people believe this is the first written human language, this cuneiform. And this is his name, Nebuchadnezzar. The Nebuchadnezzar I was probably his grandfather because his father was Nabopolazar. So, he is Nebuchadnezzar II. He is also known as Nebuchadnezzar the Great because of his military campaigns, yes, but also because of all the construction projects he engaged in, in rebuilding and um, uh, making more beautiful and more uh, regal the um, city-state of Babylon. He rebuilt the palace, the temples, and a temple tower. A temple tower is another way of saying a ziggurat. He, um, and a ziggurat was a temple uh, tower that was constructed, um, do I say later, I think, in the honor of a particular god. 
So he rebuilt the palaces there in Babylon, the temples, and at least one temple tower in Babylon, and added more buildings and more fortifications. Four kings reigned after him, biblically, we can establish that, that after Nebuchadnezzar finished his reign, um, and before Belshazzar, four kings reigned. Then, after Belshazzar, Babylon fell to Darius and the Medo-Persian Medo Empire in 539, and then later to Cyrus. It was during the first three years of Belshazzar, and that's why I tied up, gave you this information, and it may go in one ear and out the other, but maybe a little bit will stick that uh, there's Nebuchadnezzar, then four kings, then Belshazzar. He's at the end of these, uh, um, reign, this reign of Babylon when um, Darius came in and then later Cyrus. And, but it's during the reign of Belshazzar that the great visions of Daniel 7 and 8 were given. So near Daniel is an old man by this time. He's lived through all these Nebuchadnezzar and four kings and then Belshazzar going on. Any, I just want to tell you a little bit, I hope I'm not boring you, a little bit of um, the ziggurats or these tower temples. Each of the chief cities of Mesopotamia had at least one of these ziggurats or staged towers. They're called staged towers because they're in levels different stages going up and they dominate these towers or these ziggurats dominate the lower part or the ground part where a temple was established for this particular god false god of course and the ziggurats themselves were solid structures no rooms in them no wandering about in them like you might think of the pyramids and different things occurring. They were just solid st um, towers built each level smaller than the one it's built upon, working its way up to the top tier at which uh, on which was set a little shrine dedicated to that city's patron god. It's like Babel, the Tower of Babel. This was a um, more... A, a gigantic approach to a tower because they wanted to reach into heaven and find and unto God. Well, here these smaller ziggurats work their way up, maybe seventy feet up, to the top layer where a shrine was built for their patron god. And but to get there, they would have sloping uh, stairways usually three, one from the west, one from the east, and one from the central, working their way up hundreds of steps to get up to this top layer. Here is a picture, a photograph of the temple tower or the ziggurat of Ur, where Abraham lived. This, of course, is reconstructed, but in the foreground, you can see um, the, the uh, bottom layer of a temple to whatever god this ziggurat was built to. So the temple and the ziggurat often were in the same uh, land area. One was the temple where the priest and things, rooms were, and priests walked in and out and so forth. And the tower itself was built in honor of this patron god. It, this particular one stood uh, 70 feet tall, and in the flat land there, this was a tall building. Here's um, the reconstruction of it at Ur. You can see off to, to the left the incline or the stairs going up to where the shrine would be. Uh, this next staircase is the middle staircase going up, and then, of course, there was if you look at this picture, north-south um, arrangement, there would have been an east staircase. Here's a picture of one of the staircases. But going on. 
there are only four known images of what Nebuchadnezzar looked like. Most surviving today in a poor state and carved on the faces of cliffs in Lebanon. The best preserved image is found on the stele of Nebuchadnezzar II. It depicts a bearded Nebuchadnezzar dressed in his robe, wearing a conical crown, and holding a long staff. He is standing before a ziggurat, a tower dedicated to Marduk and has an inscription, and we'll get a picture of that. And I mention that because now we're going to talk about Daniel and in, in some of these pictures associated with it will be this um, engraving of Nebuchadnezzar, and you can see it. But Daniel now, another, the last player <laughs> that we're going to talk about, setting the stage for understanding what Daniel has written down, the, um, the uh, uh, environment he was living in, who he was serving, what Nebuchadnezzar was like, etc. We're going to get into that more in depth, but I want to give you an understanding of what life was like there. Daniel was taken to Babylon in 605 BC during the accession year of Nebuchadnezzar. Now that's important. Remember, um, Nebuchadnezzar hurried home when his father died, but when he was first in Babel, um, Jerusalem and in Judea, he came, his father was still reigned, and he was an emissary. He was sent on this project of disciplining these wayward people who were not honoring Babylon and sending back tribute, etc. So this happened um, when his father, this started when his father was still on the throne. His father died and he hurried back. That's the ascension year. That's when he ascended to the throne. We call that the ascension year, and that's important. You're going to see as we go on because if you don't understand this, someone can tell you, ah, oh, there's a contradiction in what Daniel 1, 1 says. What does Daniel 1, 1 say? It says, in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, in Jeremiah 25, 1, we read it was in the fourth year. And so the way to understand this is not only the archaeological finds that we have unearthed, we as a human population has unearthed recently, but also because of this ascension year going on. So, and it was in his third year of captivity, in the third year of Daniel's captivity, that he interpreted the king's dream of this great image. Now, we know it was the third year because he was educated for three years and then stood before the king as a wise man. So, in his third year, after the years of education going on, now here's the stele, and in the top right corner you can see this image. It's not very clear, and I'm going to make it clear. Not me. Others have made it clear, but I'm going to present it to you. But here, and you can see his feet are down here, and there's something, a ziggurat here. Do you see that staircase uh, line there? And uh, there's cuneiform written at the base. But this is the best we have of King Nebuchadnezzar, his conical crown. But let me just read here. Now we're moving to Daniel. For some time he held a high position in Nebuchadnezzar's government and became a trusted counselor of the king. Under Nebuchadnezzar's successors, Daniel's service is not revealed in the book. We don't know anything about it until the night of Babylon's fall, when he was called in to interpret the mysterious handwriting, mini mini teko yefarsim, on the wall. Shortly after this event, he once more rose to a high position of honor and responsibility in the newly formed Persian Empire. Going on. Now you'll see what um, 
someone has t done to this stele that shows Nebuchadnezzar. They've outlined it so you can see it better. And so here he is, Nebuchadnezzar, holding his staff and something in his hand. And he's looking toward this ziggurat. You see, Nebuchadnezzar worshipped Marduk, although we will read, if we have time this morning, in the book Education and uh, Sister Cushing, I was glad you shared that uh, chapter from Education on Health be, uh, and Diet, because we, our lesson is going to focus on diet pretty soon. But we are told that uh, Nebuchadnezzar worshipped Marduk, and so this probably is the ziggurat he had built or rebuilt or embellished, I don't know which, um, on the ziggurat that was already present. Remember, he, he had the hanging gardens. Uh, he did a lot. He was an educated, intelligent person, but he was sensitive too. He was sensitive to the care of the captives. He was sensitive to flowers and gardens and he wanted to, to know a lot about everything. And, and so here we have the cigarette. But uh, let me read all the visions of Daniel recorded in chapter 7 through 12 were received during the last years of his life. The first one in chapter 7 was in Belshazzar's first year, i.e. 552, or maybe later. And the last one in chapters 10 through 12, 12 in the third year of Cyrus, 536-35. It was probably at this time, the third year of Cyrus, when Daniel was nearly 90 years old, that he was commanded to conclude his book, to seal it up. And because of that thought, people have concluded that Daniel's prophetic ministry dated from back 603 with Nebuchadnezzar down to 535. That's a long stretch of time. And we just have little tidbits of what he was shown or what Nebuchadnezzar, you know, what happened during those periods of time. But they are enough for us to gain great lessons from the life of Daniel going on. Oh, here's another artist's depiction of this stele of Nebuchadnezzar. It makes it a little clearer. I don't know what the cuneiform is saying over here on the western side of the picture or what the top maze is for, but the bottom part is the ziggurat, and there is Nebuchadnezzar. Now, among the hundreds of manuscript fragments found in the first Qumran cave are three fragments from the book of Daniel taken or showing parts of Daniel 1, parts of Daniel 2, and parts of Daniel 3. That's just for your information. Here's another rendering on the stele of what you can see if you have good eyes. The book of Daniel is divided into two main parts. We know that. The record of historical events from the life of Daniel and his three friends, and the record of the two prophetic dreams of King Nebuchadnezzar interpreted by Daniel by the gift of God, as well as the records of the visions Daniel himself received. Now, here's a picture of the original gate there in Babylon. You can see the animals on it. Daniel was taken captive, we know, during the reign of King Jehoiakim. Jeho Jehoiakim had remained faithful, or I should say loyal, to, to Babylon for a few years. But eventually, under the persuasion of um, a pro-Egyptian party in his, um, in his um, camp, as well as the pressures from Egypt, he eventually sided with Egypt, left uh, paying tribute and being loyal to Babylon and sided with Egypt. And as a result, Babylon sent military invasions 
Its citizens lost liberty, were taken captive, and Jehoiakim lost his life. His son, Jehoiachin, was his successor. Now, that's not his original name. You'll find it in scripture, but he's known as Jehoiachin and was his successor. Eliakim, I think, was his original name. And after a brief reign of only three months, the armies of Babylon returned to Judah. He, together with thousands of citizens, were taken into captivity. This is the second invasion. He was blinded. His success, no, not he, Zedekiah was blinded. Uh, his successor, Zedekiah, apparently tried to remain loyal to Babylon, but was weak and vacillating, and again, soon sided with Egypt. As a result, Nebuchadnezzar returned. For two and a half years, the Babylonian armies ravaged Judah, took and destroyed its cities, including Jerusalem and the temple in Jerusalem and the palaces in Jerusalem, and led the majority of the inhabitants back into captivity in Babylon. A few were allowed to remain. These were like the peasants to keep the land going and whatever, but no leadership there, no um, anybody, no anybody to side with Egypt of importance, anybody of importance. So Daniel was taken captive during the reign of Jehoiakim. His Jehoiakim's son Jehoiachin was his successor. And after a reign of only three months, armies returned, and he, with thousands of citizens, were taken back to Babylon. His successor was Zedekiah. Um, and Daniel was in Babylon during these set, last two invasions and probably saw the Babylonian armies depart for their campaigns against his homeland and saw their victorious return and the arrival of fellow Jews. Among the captives that came back were King Jehoiachin and his family. You can read about it in Second Kings. And later, the blinded king, Zedekiah. You can read about him also in Second Kings during these years. Daniel and his three friends performed their duties as royal officers. After their educational training, they became members of the group known as the wise men, who served the king as advisors. It was as a wise man, as, as part of this group, that Daniel explained to Nebuchadnezzar under the uh, gift of God, the, uh, the interpretation of the dream he had of the image. As a result, Daniel was appointed to a position of exceptionally high rank, which he seems to have held for many years. Now, before we do any more talking, let me just share some uh, um, quotations of inspiration. The first few are taken from the book Education. <clears throat> probably after the chapter that was shared with us. It's page 54.3. Before I read okay. it. Now, Education 54. From the comparative simplicity of their Judean home, these youth of royal line were transported to the most magnificent of cities, and I should say of city-states, uh, it's like a nation, only it's a big city housing um, this nation or this, what can I say, um, empire of Babylon. But anyway, she says, the most mag magnificent of cities to the court of its greatest monarch and were singled out to be trained for the king's special service. Strong were the temptations surrounding them in that corrupt and luxurious court. The fact that they, the worshippers of Jehovah, 
were captives of Babylon, that the vessels of God's house had been placed in the temple of the gods of Babylon, that the king of Israel was himself a prisoner in the hands of the Babylonians, was boastfully cited by the victors as evidence that their religion and customs were superior to the religion and custom of the Hebrews. In other words, their God ruled. And that's why we could capture you, take back the um, things from the temple, even bring the king back. Our God rules, not yours. Going on. Under such circumstances, just think and try to envision Daniel and his companions, their young men, uh, uh, being made fun of or uh, dem being demeaned for their religion. Okay, going on in education. Under such circumstances, through the very humiliations that Israel's departure from his commandments had invited God gave to Babylon, evidence of his supremacy, of the holiness of his requirements, and of the sure result of obedience. And this testimony he gave, as alone it could be given, through those who still held fast their loyalty. What she's saying is, yes, the Babylonians made fun, of Daniel and his companions. They um, denigrated their religion. But God had a plan. And God's plan was to show to them, the Babylonians, his supremacy. And he was to show it to them through Daniel, through his companions, through anyone who held fast to their loyalty to God. And so when uh, we read about Daniel purposing in his heart, he was holding fast. I can't say, you can't say, I don't know if anyone can say, if the thousands of captives that were brought back held fast, but we know only Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did not bow to the golden image. Everyone else did. If other Israelites were there. We'd, I don't know. Maybe you know. But nevertheless, they purposed in their heart, Daniel and his four friends. And um, God could use them. And he used them, Daniel in particular, to um, show to the king in particular and to the rest of these wise men and to the prince of the eunuchs and Melzar, etc., it all started there, that God is super, the, the God we worship, the God of all the universe is supreme to Marduk and anyone else. And, and that was his purpose. They, God brought them there under the captivity, under the punishment of Judah in general, leaving God and worshiping idols. But those that those four people who determined in their hearts to stay faithful and loyal to God. God had a plan. And part of that plan was as a witness to these people. Let's go on. And we're running out of time. To Daniel. Education 54.4. To Daniel and his companions, at the very outset of their career, there came a decisive test. The direction that their food should be supplied from the royal table was an expression, and I refer to this, both, both of the king's favor and of his solicitude or care for their welfare. But a portion having been offered to idols, the food from the king's table was consecrated to idolatry. And in partaking of the king's bounty, these youth would be regarded as uniting in his homage to the false gods. In such homage, loyalty to Jehovah forbade them to participate. And of course, I'm sure you're thinking, one day we will be required 
to pay homage to um, the Sabbath of the papacy. I put Sabbath in quotes. They call it a Sabbath, uh, i.e. Sunday worship. But any kind of homage to Sunday worship is, is a homage to a false god. I'm just thinking out loud. Maybe you know better. But in such, going back to the quotation, in such homage loyalty to Jehovah forbade them to participate, nor dared they risk the enervating effect of luxury and dissipation on physical, mental, and spiritual development. And so it's twofold here. If they partook of this food, in part offered first to idols, they would be paying homage to that idol or to idolatry. But also, the food was terrible. <laughs> it would um, uh, uh, cause dissipation physically, mentally, and spiritually. Let's go on. Education 55. Daniel and his companions had been faithfully instructed in the principles of the Word of God. They had learned to sacrifice the earthly to the spiritual, to seek the highest good, and they reaped the reward, their habits of temperance and their sense of responsibility as representatives of God called to noblest development the powers of mind, excuse me, powers of body, mind, and soul. At the end of their training, in their examination with other candidates for the honors of the kingdom, there was found none like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah going on, I think, in education. This is now on 57. She talks, before she gets to this paragraph, she talks about the youth of today. God calls upon the youth of today to do likewise as Daniel and his four friends did. But then she goes on to say, the, and we love this quotation, the greatest want of the world is the want of men, men who will not be bought or sold, men who in their inmost souls are true and honest, men who do not fear to call sin by its right name, men whose conscience conscience is as true to duty as the needle to the pole, men who will stand for the right though the heavens fall. This particular paragraph we've used and read and cherished for a long time, I dare say, but it's written in the context of the early life of Daniel and his three companions who chose pulse and water to drink rather than the food and drink of the king's table. The greatest want is the want of these kind of men. Going on, she says, But such a character is not the result or acts is not the result of accident. It is not due to special favors or endowments, you might think, oh, he had good parents, he had a good hereditary lineage good epigenes, perhaps, but she says it's not due to special favors or endowments of providence. A noble character is the result of self-discipline, of the subjection of the lower to the higher nature, the surrender of self for the service of God, service of love to God and man. Now in Prophets and Kings, we read on 481.1, the king, Nebuchadnezzar II, did not compel the Hebrew youth to renounce their faith, faith in favor of idolatry. He wanted that, my words. But he hoped to bring this about gradually. <laughs> we should take a lesson from this by giving them names significant of idolatry, by bringing them daily into close association with idolatrous customs and under the influence of the seductive rites of heathen worship, he hoped to induce them 
to renounce the religion of their nation and to unite with the worship of the Babylonians. Uh, end quote. Now, I don't know what Nebuchadnezzar saw in Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that was different than any of the other captives brought back from Judea. But he saw something. He was sensitive to something that these four people, I want to go to my school. I want them, uh, the school of Babylon. I want them to learn our language. I want them to study everything we know about science, the universe, uh, plants, whatever. They're to know math, know these things. He gave them an elite education. And, um, and then he tested them. He himself personally tested them. And they came through with flying colors ten times better than anyone else going through the same elite school. And this is, of course, the result of the blessing of God. But uh, Daniel and his four friends had a part to play in that. And that part was, yes, their diet. They chose not to eat at the king's table. And they chose, they first went to the prince, then prince of the eunuchs, and the prince denied them. Then they went to the chief put over them and said, just try us, you see. They didn't give up. And um, so they ate pulse and drank water. Now, let me go on. Um, but keep this in mind. Nebuchadnezzar was wise in psychology also. He knew if he just exposed someone long enough to error that their defenses would most likely go down. They would somehow assimilate something of that error. He knew that um, bringing, um, uh, having them see the false worship, that all these barriers would somehow crumble over time. And that's true for people whose feet are not planted on the Word of God. L.O.I. tells us only those will go through the time of trouble who have fortified their minds with the truths of God's Word. Now, let me get here. because I want to just give you another thought, and then we'll finish this up next time. And I know there's a new lesson, Sabbath by Sabbath, but I promise you this introduction might take a, will take a couple of Sabbaths, but then we'll catch up, like we did with the sanctuary. We introduced and went over some important groundwork and then went into the study. And we're going to do the same for Daniel, this important groundwork. But what I want to say here is on slide 35. Sometimes people might say, there's no need for you to go to the university or to college to get any more education. Jesus is coming soon. And it's true Jesus is coming soon. And it's true our minds need to be fortified with the truths of the Bible. But we are not to neglect the develop, our intellectual development. Here in Prophets and Kings 486, and I say intellectual, I mean um, non-biblical <laughs> development in math, in science, in um, biochemistry, whatever it might be. Here she says, in in acquiring the, Bab the wisdom of the Babylonians, Daniel and his companions were far more successful than their fellow students. But their learning did not come by chance. They obtained their knowledge by the faithful use of their powers under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. They placed themselves in connection with the source of all wisdom making the knowledge of God the foundation of their education. You might want to study to be, I don't know, what 
a doctor, let's say a doctor, you have to know science. You have to know how the body operates, etc. But, and so you might go to a secular institution to learn that. But she says here, of course, these four people were there against their will, but they were placed in a secular institution um, and for the development of their um, powers, their mind. And, but they made the foundation of it all, she says, the knowledge of God. And so, that, but that's not all. Let's go on and then I'll summarize. They made the knowledge of God the foundation of their education. In faith, they prayed for wisdom and they lived their prayers. They placed themselves where God could bless them going on. They avoided that which would weaken their powers and improved every opportunity to become intelligent in all lines of learning. They followed the rules of life that could not fail to give them strength of intellect, i.e., in context, their diet going on. They sought to acquire knowledge for one purpose, that they might honor God. They realized that in order to stand as representatives of true religion amid the false religions of heathenism, they must have clearness of intellect and must perfect a Christian character. And God himself was their teacher. Constantly praying, conscientiously studying, keeping in touch with the unseen, they walked with God as did Enoch. Now, um, so, you might be in a secular institution of learning. Don't feel bad about that. Don't, God wants you to develop your minds. Of course, if your learning is about music of the uh, 21st century, I mean, secular music, you, uh, there might be a reason to doubt. But if you are studying, and the studying is to um, honor God, then do as Daniel and his friends did. They, um, let's go back, they um, placed themselves in connection with the source of all wisdom, making the knowledge of God their foundation of education. They prayed for wisdom. They lived their prayers. They placed themselves where God could bless them. They avoided that which would weaken their powers, improved every opportunity be to become intelligent in all lines of learning. <clears throat> they sought to acquire all of this that they might honor God. So if your desire is to be a history teacher, for example, um, and uh, and there's a lot of secular history that's pretty repugnant. But if you want to honor God in the history classroom, you will put all of this in the framework of God's intervention on earth. And yes, the Nazi powers did this, and yes, Pol Pot did that, and Nebuchadnezzar did this, and so forth. But you want to honor God through this line of history. It can be done. And you have to learn some bad history to do it. But keep in mind, your purpose is to honor God. And that's where I'll quit. Is there anything you would like to share? We'll pick up where we left off next time. Father, our future may look dark and dreary. Our future may look hopeless. But in Jesus, all this darkness disappears. And we know, Father, that you have a plan for each of our lives. Help us not to dally on this earth. Help us not to waste our time in frivolous things. We do need breaks, it's true, but let us find these breaks in recreation with you out in nature or whatever. Father, you have a way to develop our mental physical and spiritual um, um, parts of our lives. So please, Father, come into us. Fill us with your spirit. Direct in every decision we, we need to make. Direct in whatever 
things we are faced with that maybe um, seem um, the end of life. It might be a, uh, an illness. It might be our age. Who knows, Lord? But give us hope in you and give us direction and guide our feet. And may all that we do only bring honor and glory to you. That's our purpose, Father. That's what we want. We want to purpose in our hearts, as Daniel and his friends did, to serve you. We'll talk about diet later, Lord. But right now, on this Sabbath day, may we walk with you as Enoch did. In Jesus' name, amen. And yes, I meant to tell you, diet's coming up. So please come back. <laughs> Bye for now.